I just remember watching the explosion go out, come out of the ground into the back of my, my, my seven ton where I was supposed to be sitting. And I just remember watching like just the wings of this seven ton, open, like the, where the armor kind of like turned into wings, just bowed out. And then, shoo, boom, what's up you guys? My name is Byron Rogers. I was a United States Marine um, infantryman from 2004 to 2008 with 3-1 Lima Company Weapons Platoon. I was an 0351 anti-tank assaultman. Yeah, so I was born in the Bahamas, in Nassau, Bahamas. Um, my parents got divorced, uh, and so my mom was from Washington State, so I'm kind of a hybrid black guy, right? Like, uh, from the island, but also I grew up in the country. Um, I didn't realize black guys, African Americans couldn't really swim until uh, <laughs> I went to the Marine Corps and my buddies were like, yo, we finna drown Rogers today. And I was like, no, bro, like, <laughs> I can swim. I'll probably swim better than you. <laughs> they're like, yeah, right, dark green Marines don't swim. And I was just kind of like, what are you talking about? And then I watched all of the other black guys in my platoon drown <laughs> while we were at the tank. Oh, man. But anyway, so yeah, you know, I grew up on the island spearfishing growing up and then then Washington State, man, playing football and stuff like that. So summers in the Bahamas, winters in Washington. You know, I've done a lot of podcasts and a lot of interviews, and I've had a lot of um, success by the grace of God. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's just crazy to me because I'm just not where I am because I've been so smart or because I've been so clever or because I've been so strong. You know, I'm probably easily uh, one of the most premier, most recognized professional protectors in the world. Um, the number one executive protection avatar. You know, if you look up online, executive protection bodyguard, you're going to see, you know, you're going to see me all over the place. And the reality of my life <clears throat> is simply that I've been protected, you know. I'm only alive because I've been protected. I'm only here because um, I've been guided. You know, uh, I've had a relationship with my creator, Jesus Christ, my whole life since I was a boy. And um, that one relationship has steered me through my life supernaturally. And, you know, because of the events of my life, you know, it's just become even more heavy on my heart especially given the success that I've been having in life. And, you know, you know, I talked about it last time. I'll probably talk about it again, getting blown up with 62 pounds of explosives, having an out-of-body experience, and then, you know, coming back, begging God, praying while I was in another dimension for another chance to come do this thing, you know, and, 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 and that being kind of the ethos of my second, my second chance at life, you know, being in the places that he's brought me to, I just have to, I have to talk about it. And you'll hear it in my content and you'll see me always say like, I thank God for his grace or whatever, but I've never just laid out in an interview what exactly he's done for me, how he's placed me where he's placed me, how he's saved my life and the life of my family repeatedly, how faithful he's been to me. And so that was one of the huge things and, 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 and the source of power that is and the source of love that that is. You know, I... Uh, like I said, I grew up in the Bahamas and, you know, I was raised in church and I, you know, at a very young age was, um, you know, introduced to Christianity is just how my family was. And so, you know, Sunday school, all the stuff. And I just remember as a young kid, you know, I think I forget, I think it was a story of Samuel, you know, and, um, there's a part in that story where like God is trying to talk to one of the younger kids in the story and um, the, the younger prophet, you know, goes in to talk with Samuel and he's like, hey, I'm hearing this voice and I like don't know what it is. And then finally the older prophet Samuel, I think it was Samuel, I don't remember, but he was just like, you know, hey, that voice is is God and you need to acknowledge him. You need to engage him next time he talks with you. And then he does and like all the beautiful things in that story happen. Um, and so I remember learning that story in my nursery, like, dude, I was like five, <laughs> you, know, you know, and um, when you're five, like everything's real, you know, like you don't even really know, like you make up a story and the story's real, you know, and I, I, um, you know, and, and, and it, it's funny, you know, because 
Right. I don't remember the, the exact story that well, but like the other thing you should know about this is it, it's not a holy thing. Like this isn't about being perfect or, or any of those things. It's literally about the fact that like your creator and my creator has wanted to have a relationship with me. And regardless of all the drugs and partying and women and um, wasting and, and, and things that I've chosen to do, he's always been faithful to me. Right. So it's not about my perfection, but it's about my heart being in the right posture and um, and and moving through life that way uh, with this relationship. But I was I was like five. I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm in the Bahamas, and it's like the shanty. It's like this is before my dad made money, right? So uh, you know, it's there's roosters and chickens on the street, and we're living in like this small little building that he would eventually turn into an office. You know, it's a little structure, and there's like tin roofs and like you know, greenhouses and stuff, right? We're back in the village. Um, and uh, my dad had just started the first task force, uh, like security task force in the Bahamas. So uh, he started locking more dudes up than the police because, you know, police just want their, their um, lunchbox money, right? Um, <clears throat> so my dad's like doing some good work, getting in the way of some important and powerful people. And sure enough, I'm sitting in the living room going to sleep on the couch my pops is already asleep and I just remember making the decision like, yo, I'm going to sleep here and um, watching TV, the AC's going, I'm comfortable. I grab some blankets. I got a little pillow there and I'm like, yo, I'm just going to knock out real quick. And uh, all of a sudden I just get woken up and I remember not being able to fall asleep and I'm like, eh, I'm just going to go to sleep here. And I remember trying and then all of a sudden I hear this voice that's just like, go sleep in your room, go sleep in your dad's room. And I'm like, you know, it wasn't creepy because it was like a, it wasn't like an actual voice, but it was like, I think what they call a similitude where it's like, like I, I, like I heard words, but I didn't hear a voice. Like it, there was information coming into my being. And I just was like, and when you're five, everything's real. So, you know, it's a real story. So I was like, no, <laughs> I'm comfortable. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and then it comes back again, like go sleep in your father's room. And I'm like, nah, I'm like, I'm good. Why? Why? Like, I'm like, no, I'm good. And then I'm like, get trying to get comfortable. And then that story kind of comes back to me, you know, like the little boy didn't realize who was talking to him. And then I try to get comfortable again. And then boom, it comes back again, go sleep in your father's room. And I'm just like, Ugh. and I remember saying, yo, if you're like, like in the room, just like this, if you're not going to let me go to sleep uh, out here, I'm just going to go in my dad's room. And I get up, I go in my dad's room and most, mostly angry because I realized like whatever, you know, like God wasn't letting me sleep out there. And, you know, like now I know it was the Holy Spirit who's been with me this whole time, you know, and, um, and I get to my dad's room and then I hear instantly, go get your sister. Well, I got a big sister. My big sister is like, 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 was like Queen Latifah, you know, like, I'm like this little dude. She's older than me, bigger than me, stronger than me. And I remember saying like, you're supposed to know everything. And if you know everything, you know, I can't go get my big sister because she'll beat me up. And, um, the spirit comes back and says, go, go out in the living room and I'll tell you what to do. So I go out in the living room before I can say anything. I look at her and I hear, take her blankets. So I walk up and I just snatch the blankets off her body and I run in the room really quick. And uh, sure enough, because the AC was blasting, a few minutes later she comes in the room. I'm like still sitting there and she like beats me up a little bit, takes all the blankets, rolls herself up and I'm just like, ah. Uh. You know, and I'm just, and I get like a little bit of blanket or whatever and then the voice comes back one more time. He's like, lock the door. So I'm like, okay, like at this point I've given up like arguing. I'm just like, okay, cool. Like what, what else? So I lock the door and I sit there and I remember sitting there in my dad's room in this little room in the Bahamas and I'm just like looking around and uh, I'm like, is there anything else? And I just felt peace. Like, like I just knew I wasn't going to hear anything. Like it was like, okay, you're done with me. I was like, okay, cool, whatever. I'm finally going to go to sleep. And I lay down and uh, drift off into sleep. And I just remember waking up, boom, wide awake. And I'm listening for this voice. I'm listening for some instructions. And I'm like looking around, but I hear, I just feel this feeling like, like, like I'm not going to say anything. I just felt like I knew he wasn't going to say anything. And um, 
I'm looking around the room and it's quiet. And then I start to hear this little like, like clickety clack, click clack clack, scratchy scratch, clack clack. And I'm like, what is that sound? And I'm looking around and I'm looking and sometimes like rats would try to come through the AC unit in the wall. So I'm like looking at the AC unit and like trying to tiptoe on and off the bed and stuff and not wake up my stepmom, my dad. And I'm like looking around the room and I'm like hearing this like noise and I'm like, what is that sound? And then all of a sudden I just look in front of me and like right in front of my little five-year-old face, the doorknob is just, is just, just shaking and rattling like crazy. And there's somebody that's trying to pick the lock to our room and um, that boogeyman fear, you know, that I just fear seizes my little body and I'm staring at this doorknob and my dad's right over, you know, on the bed. And I just remember thinking like, you got to move, you got to make a move, you got to make a move. So I, I, I go over to my dad and my dad snores like a straight up chainsaw. So like, you know, the whole house is vibrating, like the, the ceiling fans vibrating. He's like snoring. Rah! And I, and I just remember walking up and like touching him and being like, dad, 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 like dad, someone's trying to get in the room. And then he wakes up and he stops snoring. And when he stops snoring, um, obviously they stop. And I was like, you gotta believe me. Like someone's trying to get in. Someone's trying to get in. And, um, he's like, hand me my shotgun. So I, I go underneath the crib where his shotgun is and I get his shotgun. I bring it over to him and, uh, he gets up, racks around and you hear like six dudes just go flying out of the house, uh, trip over the coffee table, and the, the, the screen door slams behind these dudes. And um, he gets out butt naked, clears the house with the shotgun, all that stuff. Uh, in the Bahamas, like where we were living, like those dudes break into your house on a robbery, like. You know, it's like South Africa, like they'll clean your house out in like eight minutes. Like you're like, you don't even hear them. Your whole living room's empty and everything's gone. My dad was starting to make money, you know, at that point, you know, now he's a successful businessman down there and all that. But like, there was all kinds of valuable stuff. Nothing was stolen. We got footage of them uh, coming in and running out of the house. My dad was locking up and working on cases to lock up some pretty big dudes supporting the, the police force at that time. So, you know, all signs point to the fact that it was like an assassination attempt on my dad and on our family. And uh, I would have been sitting there on the couch, sleep, and uh, with my sister, his door would have been wide open. And, um, you know, that's kind of where it really, really began for me. I, I realized that I was... I was protected, you know, and um, that maybe there was a purpose for me. And, you know, that kind of set the tone for the first part of my life where I was just like, always just listening, you know, I was just like trying to, you know, make sure I didn't lose that connection. And, um, you know, through a lot of different things, through my mom, single mom, single parenting, and, and then into the Marine Corps, he was always there kind of guiding me. But I only heard his voice like that like three times my entire life. Everything else has been really internal. And, and at times I've been farther away from him. And then at times I've been closer to him. Um, at times when I've been farther from him, even like doing a bunch of drugs, he still has told me things and he still guided me. And he still put me in a position where, you know, at one point in time I was, you know, dealing with some people that I really care about. And I was able to walk up to them and just say, hey, you know, like, you know, she's ready to tell you the truth now, you know, go in the back room and talk about it. And not without me even knowing, because he just told me, now is the moment, you know, this is what's happened. She's going to tell him the truth. She's struggling with it right now. Go and, and tell them that. And then boom, she goes in the back room, tells them everything. And their relationship is able to actually move to the next level and things like that. It's been an amazing way to live. How did you manage to... Um to sleep after that man did you guys stay in that house or like man that yeah was man my dad he you know he upgraded his security systems um really i remember that and, and he just i mean for me it was kind of like you know what like i was protected like i just knew like there was a reason you know that i was still alive like i was i, I knew that like i was checking in with 
you know, the father all the time. And like, I just kind of was like, if something's going to happen, he's going to tell me like, you know, and, um, there've been a number of situations that I've been in where it's like the, the plane, you know, when I got into executive protection, we traveled, hit 60 some odd countries my first year. I lived like that on repeat for seven years, you know, I, uh, and, and we spent over two weeks in private jets, right? You know, private jets crash more than, you know, uh, public, you know, commercial flights. And there's just times when it's like, everyone's like, this plane's going to crash. And I'm like, I'm not going to die yet. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> like I, it's just not that time, you know? And until so far I've been right, you know, you know, there's definitely been times in Iraq too, you know, where, so yeah, it just, you know, I, I feel like I have a purpose. What made me want to join the Marine Corps was, you know, a, a mixture of the same type of thing. You know, it's like I'm an able-bodied, you know, young man, you know, and, and I always just was kind of like, well, you know, for everyone who can't do it, I need to do something. The other part of it was a little bit of playing too much Rainbow Six, right, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then the other part of it was just like... um I'm a warrior, you know, and I, I always knew I was a warrior and I always wanted to be a warrior. And I always was like, ask God, I was always like, father, how can I be a warrior? But like for good. And like, what place does being a warrior have in the good things in life? And, 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 and he was always really faithful to like either give me a mission to this very day to do, ex to do good that only a warrior can do. Um, and or, you know, he's also shown me um, the righteous call to being a warrior in the word. You know, all over the Bible, there are strong men. You know, when God wants to get something done on this planet, he sends a man, he sends a woman. He says in Genesis, let man have dominion. You know, like right now, all over the world, women are, children are being raped and horrible things are happening. Some people want to blame God and they're like, well, why hasn't God stopped that from happening? And the reality is, you know, like, all the things that we fought against it. I, 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 I don't see angels like zip lining in windows and like rescuing kids right now. But what I do see is if there are enough good people on the planet that uh, are able to be formidable enough, right? That's what's actually able to save uh, people on this planet. And it's really interesting that like, it's kind of righteous, right? It's like in rights, it's, it, it's almost like this weird, you get what you deserve, that the quality of this world tends to be in alignment with the quality of the overall values that the world holds, you know, like if we are in good times, it's because there's a lot of good people with good values who happen to be in charge. But then if we're in bad times, it's like, it's because there's a lot of bad people with bad values that happen to be in charge. And so long story short, rabbit hole, right? Big rabbit hole. But long story short, I just saw the Marine Corps as an outlet to where I could be a warrior for the right things and um, where I could learn more about being a warrior so that, um, during the course of my life, I could bring those weapons to bear in the right ways at the right times. Dude, oh man, I'd say the, the one boot camp story that honestly stands out the most is the fact that I was the guy, bro. Like, I was the, I was the, the diet recruit that like, just royally messed up, man. Like, like it was like the beginning of platoon. Like, we got our fat kid tabs. I remember them being like, <laughs> I remember them being like, yo, you know, Give me all my obese Marines up here, you know, da, 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 da. And I remember being like, yo, I just cut. So I played 6A football at like 225, and I was small for these dudes. But I, I crushed it. I played Ironman football as a team, team captain and all that stuff. Um, but like when I wanted to get in the Marine Corps, they were like, yo, you got to cut to like 211 in order for us to even be able to talk to you. You're five, like, you know, 10 with your church shoes on, right? So... Um, then I cut down to 211 and then that first week, I think I dropped to like 206 while I was getting ready for Black Friday and then, um, Black Friday kicks off and these cats are talking about obese Marines. I think I look like an underwear model by this time. I'm 206. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I ain't been this small since like eighth grade, like literally though. So then, uh, you know, they call me in the office in my whitey tidies and they're like, yo, you're an obese Marine. And I'm like, what's happening right now? I thought this was like awesome. And then they're like, you're going to, you know, you're going to be, you need to be at least like, it was like something re like gnarly, like one, at least 192. I'm like, I ain't been under 200 pounds since I was in eighth grade. They're like, you need to be 192 before you leave my depot. And I'm just like, this is 
going to be a miracle. I left boot camp at 175 pounds. All right. So, wow. uh, but like to your story, like, yeah, man, one night, you know what I'm saying? I'm in my rack, just chilling. And, uh, uh, you know, the house mouses is up cleaning, you know, they doing their thing. And, um, sure enough, bro, one of them had like one of them Peter Pan peanut butters, man. <laughs> yo, and yo, when I tell you, so I had fat kid rations, yo, so I didn't get to have no sugar. I ain't gonna have no peanut butter. Like, I got half rations. Like, I got a piece of chicken, a hard boiled egg, some salad. You know what I'm saying? We finna burn how many calories in boot camp? Like, this was my life. I'm feeling like I'm gonna pass out before dinner. So, I'm like trying to survive. And when this dude pulled out this peanut butter, man, it was like, oh, suck. Yo, I was like, yo, what, I, what? How can I get some peanut butter? There's no supervision right now, you know? So, I get, I get this peanut butter, and it's just amazing for me. And then, uh, sure enough, bro. The next day, he's like, yeah, dog. He's like, I just grabbed a few peanut butters and I just put them in my cargo pockets and I just eat them at nighttime. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he had the hustle. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, yo, this is finna be the hustle. He's like, yeah, we can just get stuff. We can put it in a little pile. We can hide it in our stuff. And I'm like, yo, this is what's up. So I go and I get this. Uh, so when I go back to the chow hall, I'm like, yo, I can snatch some peanut butter, right? So I snatch a couple peanut butters. I throw them in my pocket, you know? And I'm like going back. And then that day, and it's just like, I don't know what kind of karmic debt BS I had. Like, it was like instant reparate. Like, I get, like, instantly, when I get out of line, I get fixed instantly. And I was like, dude, I was being perfect that day because I didn't want to go on the parade deck because then you got to empty your pockets, right? And uh, sure enough, for some random thing, there's like, but Rogers. And I'm like, what? And he's like, get on my parade deck. It was just my turn. So I'm up there and I remember, like, pulling my cover out of my pocket. When I go to pull my cover out of my pocket, like, it was like slow motion. Like I pulled my cover out of my pocket and I just could feel the room cha- bending around, like changing. And I turn around and I realized that the peanut butter had come out of my pocket. And I'm literally looking at this peanut butter and it's in slow motion. And it's like, and I like go to, I was literally going to, cause in boot camp you're like super, super hyper, like, you know, and I literally remember watching it and I was like, I'm going to catch this thing and I'm going to hide it. And I go to reach to just catch it in midair before it hits the ground. Drill instructor just goes, Shoo! you know how they got super power? And he sees it before I catch it. And I just was like, and then I just, I just brace for impact. Boom. You know, and then I'm on the floor and they're grabbing, I'm doing push ups. And uh, sure enough, dude, like I was that dude who got to eat his peanut butter while the entire platoon got smoked. Uh, <laughs> like, Recruit Rogers want to eat peanut butter. Good. The whole, everybody's out in the mud. Recruit, I'm, I'm up there eating my peanut butter. They're getting thrashed. And I had, you know, we had to have our locker room meeting that night. I had to be like, hey, guys, look, you know, like I know normally you would jump somebody for this. You can do what you want to do. I was like, but check it out. I will not fail the platoon ever again. I was like, for the rest of boot camp, I will never let you guys down. And dude, I didn't like, I was, I was, I was good. I was dialed in. I carried fools, you know, um, as much as boot camp sucked, but, uh, that was like my one, like bop, you know, I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Like I, that was my one. Give me, I will not fail you guys again. Yeah, man. Nice. <laughs> God bless boot camp. During the course of my life, you know, you know, I, I, whenever I was making a big decision, I would always just kind of like seek God, you know, I'd always kind of be like, what should I do, Father? You know, and it's not like a holy thee thou thing. It's just like, he's just always with me. He's with me in this room right now. You know, he's guiding me. You know, there was just situations where I had all obviously been protected, you know, like I was walking down the Haditha Dam, the, the wall of the Haditha Dam with my boy Hebert, with Bertie Bert, you know, and uh, all of a sudden I, I see like a hummingbird what I thought was a hummingbird just right between our, our, our heads, you know? And, um, I was like, was that a hummingbird? Like that was, and I look over and then I start to turn my head back. And then all of a sudden it happens again. But this time I hear the snap and then I see an impact. And I mean, these rounds are like going right between me and Hebert and I'm not even hearing outgoing, you know? And it was, I mean, it, it was, it, I mean, I, like, I, like I saw it, like it, may have, it must have been a big round, you know, like, um, but I hear the snap uh, and I see the impact and um, we just start running and I was just like, man, you know, I guess it wasn't my time, you know, and I, I um, once we, we started Pegasus Bridge, that whole operation, uh, 
you know, as we were rolling down the street, I always kind of had like a sixth sense when things were going to happen. So I was just kind of like, man, I don't got a good feeling. And my guys kind of knew me as that guy, you know, like we, we ended up getting into some trouble in another country, you know, what, like almost recently. And I, I remember telling the boys on the flight in, I was like, yo, I don't have a good feeling about this. I think we're all going to make it back on the plane, but I think we're going to be real happy we're, we're getting back on this plane. And it happened just like that. So I've always kind of had that. Like, he's always kind of shown me things. I've always kind of been able to see paths. Um, and so I'm sitting in the back of this Humvee, and um, I just start getting this horrible feeling. And I'm just like, ah, uh, like, ah, uh, like, and, I, and I'm just like tripping. Like, and I don't trip. Like, I'm kind of like, you know, I don't really, my relationship with my emotions is different than a lot of people's, right? Um, read the book, The Wisdom of Psychopaths, you'll understand, it's an amazing book. So anyway, so I'm sitting here and I'm just like, why am I like actually having a physiological response to how like off I feel? I need to do something. So like um, basically what happened was the unit that went in before us, India Company, got hammered like the night before. India Company and 3-1 Lima Company, Weapons Platoon, and the time I was there, these guys, these are the boat marines. Like these dudes are like, like they're like, they're like, they took the best Marines from training and put them in India Company to be boat Marines. Like all the tall, Navy seal like, like, you know, like all the elite dudes, like the top tier guys all went to boat company. And I didn't even want to be part of boat company because the stuff these cats had to do. You know what I mean? Like I was like, you know what I'm saying? I'm track company, man. We get a ride there. We get out, you know? Like, but like, I just remember being like, like, those are the, the hardest dudes in our thing. You know, like we, we tried to go heads up with them one time during a training operation. They... It's disgraceful. They wrecked, <laughs> absolutely wrecked us, right? But anyways, so this is Marine on Marine, right? But anyway, so both, like India Company goes down there and they're like, you know, we have a lot of respect for them, you know? And so they get wrecked, man. They, they take, you know, a lot of casualties. And I remember hearing like the rumor was like they took like 40% casualties overnight. Um, and uh, we were just like, what? Like not India Company, like this is impossible. Like those cats. And then... Um, Next thing you know, I was mobile assault platoon because I was weapons platoon in 3-1 Lima Company. So basically, they put us all in, 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 uh, in uh, seven tons just to roll around as QRF. Like, dudes get in contact, we roll up, we got smalls, rocket launchers, two, four, all the machine guns, all the mortars, and we're just going to end the fight right now, right? So they activate us, and they're like, weapons, mount up. So we roll out. We're going to this Pegasus Bridge. We're hearing all these stories about like what happened to, our, uh, to these dudes last night. And we show up and we spend the whole entire morning taking, um, like, like doing damage control. Like, oh, they blew a Humvee into a well, like down this hill into the swamp, into a well. We're pulling a Hummer out of a well and pulling freaking, you know, two, trying to, one Marine's diving down there trying to get this 240 Golf. There's another Hummer that was like, you know, blown up in a swamp and like drowned some dudes. And there's like all these different things going on, right? And so we spend the morning just trying to clean up. And then, uh, uh, you know, we're still kind of doing that, and we're doing a. The, there were so many IEDs that, like, EOD was like, "Yo, we we can't. We have to leave things in place. So let us know like where you want to go and how you want to move, and we'll clear the path to where you're going, um, because there's just IEDs everywhere. And so we we hop in the Humvees, um, and you know, this was the first place where. We're clearing the village, and usually it's like, oh, Ana Habibi Marines, Marines, yeah, like, Lacha Musha Hadin, like, Lacha Mushkala, like, basically, no problems. We love you guys. You guys are great. Like, come on in. You want some chai tea, the judge, some movie, whatever. So, this was the first place where it wasn't like that. Like, the Iraqis were like, they were like, you guys seem like, like good dudes. Like, you guys should probably, like, you guys should probably go home. <laughs> they were like, there's Mujahideen everywhere. <laughs> like they were like, they were like Muizin, uh, very Muizin. Like they were like telling us like, yo, like, like, like you guys are cool, but like say word, like you should just like not, not, don't be here. Like there's actually are a lot of bad guys here, you know. <laughs> and uh, we were like, yo, you know, you stupid, you know, you're young, and we're like, yo, yo, like where are they at? You know, like we can, you know, this is what we train for. Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, um. I just remember sitting in this Hummer and I remember feeling weird and being like mad triggery and being like, I can't like what's going on. And, um, my 
platoon sergeant was in front of me. He's like, Rogers, get in my Humvee. I'm going to tell you what to do at the next stop. I'm going to tell you what to do when we get to our next location. I'm like, Roger that. So I hop in his Humvee. So that's why I'm in a Humvee in the first place. I usually am in the seven ton and he's giving me, he's like kind of telling me what to do. He stops talking. I'm freaking out in the back seat. Uh, I, I see a Bible sitting in the seat in front of me and I open it up and I read and it's like the perfect passage. I don't remember what it was, but I just remember it fed my soul and I felt like better for like two seconds and then all of a sudden like the feels come back i'm looking at my boy cressa who's driving and he's like a younger new marine and like the stress is up like you always can feel it and then he's getting too close to the seven ton in front of us which is where i'm supposed to be right where i'm supposed to be so uh he's getting really close and like everyone can feel it and i remember um saying to my platoon sergeant tonto like yo tonto like i'm not i remember being like i'm not a b but like i'm not a pussy but like can i just go back to my seven time man because i got a feeling i got a bad feeling you know he's like yeah, yeah yeah check rogers he's like just when we get to this next stop i'll let you get back in your vehicle and then cressa is getting too close to the seven ton and tonto's like yo back up when they get blown up we're gonna get hit by secondaries and then uh cressa's like okay and then he's like ah, and he's driving and he's getting too close and he's like sweating and i just remember me or tonto reached up and was just like Ow, and we just cracked him in the side of the head and was like, hey, pay, pay attention, bro. Like, pay attention. You're going to get us all jacked up because you got bad nerves. And he's just like, ah. And then he backs up. And then all of a sudden, dude, I just remember watching the explosion go, uh, come out of the ground into the back of my, my, my seven ton where I was supposed to be sitting. And I just remember watching like just the wings of this seven ton, open, like the, where the armor kind of like turned into wings, just bowed out. And then shoo, the explosion went back into the ground. And then I remember watching um, Martinez, man, Martinez, Tommy Gunn just comes out the back and just wham, like straight leg falls down. Um, and uh, then, you know, you're getting out, we're running towards the, we're running towards where they just got blown up. And, you know, you're, what's going through your head is you're just like, yo, did these, these cats set up secondaries? Like, Am I running to my death? But then you're like, yo, I need to know if my guys are bleeding out, you know? And so, you know, that was the first miraculous thing about it was the fact that like that vehicle that just got wrecked, like right where I was sitting, got hammered, right? Uh, they ran over, I forget what they ran over, but right where I was sitting is what took most of the blast um, in that rear compartment. And um, I was supposed to be sitting there. The only reason I wasn't sitting there is because Tonto was like, yo, Rogers, hop in my seven, hop in my Humvee. And, you know, we'll tell you what to do. And if I was, if that had hit the Humvee, if for some reason the seven ton had not taken that blast, it's so much bigger and so much more armored, dude, we would have been toast in that Humvee. Wow. Um, and then, you know, I'm running in there and I'm seeing my boys fall out and, you know, we pull Naram out of the driver's seat and he's just completely, you know, just like, like a bowl of jello. And, um, we lay him down and we're, kind of and I'm yelling at my guys because I'm actually the squad leader in the back of that my, my 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 squad just got hit right in front of me and I'm yelling at them like hey set security set security guys who can set security we need to like start our triage site and so we're working on Naram he's totally non-responsive and then we get to the point where we're like yo uh we need to call his kill card like his kill numbers and so you know that's when you're kind of declaring a marine dead and um we're starting to you know read his kill numbers and I just remember staring at him and I remember being like man like this is crazy you know like I'm the last dude this dude like I know this dude better than his parents you know like I've seen him more I've seen him I've spent time with him I'm having flashbacks of like runs we were going on because Naren was a little bit heavy so like he would struggle during the run so I'd stay back with him and like I just remember you know like I'm looking I'm seeing the last chapters of his life and I'm staring at him right in the eyes. And I was like, dang. And I remember getting ready to look away and set security. Because in, in these type of environments where there's all these snipers, it's like you have this ditty going in your head. I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. So, like, we were told there are a lot of snipers here. So, I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. There's enough time for a sniper to pick, do whatever he needs to do for you to sight someone in. I'm up, he sees me, and then you have to move. So I'm up, he sees me, I'm down, three, four seconds. So you're always kind of trying to move and kind of like, you know, do stuff. And I remember, because we still didn't know if we were going to get ambushed, right? So, and I remember looking at him, staring at him, and then I start kind of hearing that ditty, like, hey, man, it's time to move. I'm up, he sees me. You got to like take a knee, you got to move around. And then, and then um, 
uh, we put him in this body bag and we're getting ready to like zip him up. And uh, I just get that feeling that comes to me like, hey, just stay here a second. And I do. And then right as we're zipping up the bottom of his chin, he blinks. And then we're just like, yo, you know, I think my boy Tinez may have seen it too. And uh, we rip him out of that body bag and we start trying to keep him alive and resuscitate him and stimulate him and basically beat the crap out of him to keep him alive, keep him stimulated until we can get a bird there to get him, you know. And, and in this one encounter, like, it was a very supernatural thing because, like, I almost died multiple times within the span of whatever the heck this was, you know, like 10 minutes or something. So... Now we have Naram. We're all working on keeping him alive. I'm running around making sure my squad's still setting security. You know, my guys are starting to come back to me and they're starting to say different things about like what they're finding. And I'm moving them around. Like they're finding more IEDs and all. they're giving me information. And I remember as I was looking around being like, yo, let me just take a knee real quick because um, I need to think about what we're going to do. And I looked down at my feet and there's these two hacksaw blades, you know, and they just were like, it's like a hacksaw, man, like two hacksaw blades, uh, little paper spacers right here, and then a wire that goes down into the, the, the crater there, like literally what had just blown up, it's like a hole this big, you know, and so I'm thinking like, yo, like this is what just detonated on us, like we're good, you know, like this is expended, and so I reached down, and I remember I was just going to push it like to check out and like see how like sensitive it was and whatever else. First of all, I almost ran it over because I was running up and down this path, getting my guys dug in in security positions all day long. I'm standing next to Wellerman, who was one of my other boots, and I told him, look for secondaries, right? This thing's laying right next to him. God bless him. <laughs> so, then, so then I'm about to take a knee, and I remember getting the instructions, look at your feet. I look at my feet. There's these two hacksaw blades. I'm getting ready to go down and mess with them and like, like just check it out and see how they placed it. And I hear that voice and it comes back to me. It's like, don't push that. Pick it up. And then it just is the craziest feeling of whew. like I felt for the first time in my life that like, like not protected. Like I felt for the first time in my life where it was like, yo, you have learned how to hear my voice and you've learned how to um, navigate life and you're at a choice point. Like, honestly, it was almost like, like if you don't follow this instruction, like you almost don't rate to go to the next level. Like, I'm gonna get you out of here before you ruin yourself. Or like, I don't know what it was, but what got my attention was the fact that like, I was like going down to, to, to touch it and I felt this, this thing like release off of me. And I remember kind of like, it caught my attention. And then I looked and then I yelled to my buddies and I was kind of like buying myself time. I was like, hey, this is what blew you guys up right here. And I'm yelling and it was this weird moment where it felt like everything stood still. Like my whole platoon like looked at me and I was going down and I just remembered it. And I got like right over the top of this thing and at the last second, I just was like, hmm, eh. And instead of pushing it, I just decided I would, I would examine it and pick it up and, and make sure I didn't mess with it too much. And I picked it up instead and I saw that it was actually still wired into the ground to blow. And I realized that it was a secondary explosion that was buried um, right next to the other one that didn't detonate or whatever. Um, and at that moment, man, I mean, it was like a moment where like if there were tumbleweeds in that part of Iraq, like there were... <laughs> you know, like, and, uh, man, it was gnarly. And then I, uh, dude, I got my boys in and we, we took, we went into the nearest house. Um, and you know, I, right before that, one of my other buddies, Gully, one of my other Marines came running back to me and said, Hey, there's another IED like over next to where I was. And we just completely retreated off the streets and we came into this house, like with a vengeance. Thank God no one was in that house that we decided to take over. Thank God. But uh, we took over the house next to us and um, we went firm in that house and EOD came through and they said, yeah, you were standing on top of 2155 anti-tank shells and, you know, you guys would have been picking up, you know, wallet size pieces of my Kevlar like wow. 200 feet away. I'd have been pink mist. Wow. Did the guy <laughs> that almost got zipped in the body bag, did he survive? Yeah. So the, what happened with him was... 
we kept him stimulated for you know roughly it was like it was like it was 10 minutes it felt like the rest of our lives um he and then a bird landed and then it was the wrong bird i wanted to kill these pilots bro uh, <laughs> like like they were like get him on get him on get him off this is the wrong bird. i'm like how does that happen like this uh, is a priority like what do you mean the wrong like that's impossible and they they made us you know pull him off and um, then we had to keep working on him, and then three minutes later, another bird came by and picked him up. But Pegasus Bridge was horrible. Um, you know, long story short, like, we had a unit that had to go back to our base, um, and our base was, like, a little over an hour away. Those dudes ran into such heavy resistance, it took them 20, roughly 24 hours to get back to base. Ugh. Me and the boys, we went firm in a house and ended up in a bunch of crap, and, uh, um, we spent the night in a graveyard just in 360 degree security with our eyes wide open all night. Cause they, you know, like if they were religious enough, they won't mess with you in a graveyard. Um, and we spent the night in a graveyard, man, just until the lights came back on. And then we made our way back to base hearing how the other guys dealt with it. So it was just, you know, and, and we didn't take contact once we left that area, but that was like our black hawk down for my unit, man. But yeah, Naram, Naram ended up waking up like, um, we got him to medical attention. He's okay. He ended up waking up like, you know, on the operating table. Um, if I remember right, he was just really, really, really badly knocked out or something like that. Wow. Um, and I should see him actually in a few weeks. We're going to do a reunion because one of our other buddies committed suicide. Oh man. I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. Yeah, man. I mean, there's, that was, it was a huge one. Um, but then there's also this, the other story where I was protected, man. I was in a total of five IED blasts. Um, but by far the worst and most vivid one for me was the, the one where I, um, uh, was hit with 62 pounds of homemade, 60 some pounds of homemade explosives based on EOD's assessment after the blast, um, their blast analysis. Uh, and you know, it's just interesting, man. Cause like I've worked my whole entire life to be a warrior, you know, like I have work out and do all kinds of, <clears throat> you know, I've done martial arts and I train gunfighting and I train tactics and I train strategy and I, you know, I, I've taken freaking steroids. Like I've tried everything, you know what I mean? Like to be the hardest, baddest, you know, I'm only like 5'10", but like, you know, like if there's an edge, I was trying to get it, you know what I'm saying? And like, um, even now, you know, like I have so many ideas and business things I'm trying to do, but it's like, you know, I've just realized that the only thing like, you know, in, in, in Psalms, he's like a horse is a vain hope of escape. Like you don't win battles by, by the, by your strength and by the horse and by all these things, you know, God has always been the strength of my life. You know, he's always lit my path. And so I'm sitting here and I'm going through Iraq and, um, one of our corn, my, my, uh, my corpsman says something to me like, you know, like, I'm singing a song, like we're rolling down the street. I'm singing this song, um, and uh, it's a Marine Corps song. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, you know, uh, my corpsman uh, is like, yo, you should sit back. Like, you're going to get, if we get blasted, you're going to get wrecked. And I just remember being upset, being like, dude, if we get hit, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just wreck everything. Like, I'm so upset. Like, I'm annoyed. Um, and, uh, sure enough, man, like we're rolling down the street and I hear Foster, uh, another Marine I'm going to see at our reunion. And he, you know, I say, I take, I took five blasts in Iraq. Um, I saw like 13 in my convoys. I know to like civilians, it sounds like a lot, but like that was Iraq. Like, 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 dude, like, 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 it's nothing special for an infantry Marine. Like when I was there, like, that's like, you know, it's, it's a little more than, than, than most, I guess, you know, but like, it wasn't weird. Like everyone in my platoon got blown up. You know what I'm saying? Foster had the most, he had like close to 10 blasts under his belt that he had survived. I watched Foster get launched. I watched Foster get in an argument with a machine gunner in the morning because he didn't want to wear his full Gumby suit because it's like 120 some degrees out. His, his, his caviar, his body art, his protection, he's like, the one machine gunner, Bowman's like, yo, man, you got your half, your lower half of your body's inside the vehicle, bro. You don't need to wear the lower half of the Gumby suit. And Foster's like, bump that. <laughs> he's like, I'm wearing everything. I'm wearing everything. That 
day, homie. I literally remember watching my Marines and I'm looking right over Foster's shoulder as he's waving. He's waving at some kids. Uh, there's, there's a truck coming up over a hill. We, we're going down the street. We take a turn. There's a truck coming up over the hill. This is a rabbit hole. Officially, it's happening. And, and uh, Foster's like waving at these little girls in this truck. And kaboom. And I just watch just their vehicle get like just boom. It's gone. And I just remember being like, I lower my weapon. I get out of the vehicle. I'm running down. I hop down, climb down the bottom of a seven ton. I'm starting to run, boom, engine block hits the floor. I run, I'm rolling up on the vehicle, and I'm like rolling up on the pieces of their vehicle, and then Foster hits the floor, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and the craziest thing about it was, he's getting up, and he's using his rifle to get up, and I don't know if it was slung to him, but yo, my man was in the air for like, Yo, it had to be like eight seconds <laughs> while man was in there. Like long enough for me to get the freaking ladder down, get down, run, get up then, and then sprint almost to the vehicle. I was like, gosh, man, you know, wow. so anyways, God bless Foster. So he had like a six cents for getting blown up. Yeah, you know I mean, cause dude, you know. Um, and all of a sudden Foster was just like, yo, he was like, you know, I hear him on the radio, silverback. I got a weird feeling, you know, like I'm gonna stop and look around. I'm like, yo, do whatever you gotta do, Foster. Like, Roger that. Do whatever you have to do and then um all of a sudden man like we're rolling to a stop and then i'm just in a black room you know and uh i don't know what happened i don't know how i got there i don't know anything but what was really interesting to me about it was i was fine like i was totally chill like it was like this ish and i was just kind of like you know, like that John Travolta skit where John Travolta's kind of like that from, from uh, uh, Pulp Fiction where he's just kind of like <laughs> that little meme or whatever. But like, I was just kind of like, just chill. And I was in this dark space and then I kind of um, eventually started to kind of kind of be like, yo, what, where am I? Like, why is everything okay? And um, I started to try to remember. And I remember knowing that I could pull up my last thoughts and I was, I, I remember asking, like, what were my last thoughts? And then I saw, like, this MS-DOS, like, green cursor, like, it was the Matrix or something. And I just remember seeing, like, you know, why is the water cooler, like, trying to come up my butt? And I was like, what? Like, why is the water cooler trying to... And then I started to realize, like, oh, like, I started to recall, like, I was sitting on a water cooler. Because in the back of the seven ton, like, I was the troop commander, so I had to figure out the safest place to sit. So, like all the way at the back, in the corner, on top of a Gatorade water cooler. And I guess that was the last thing that my brain was able to comprehend. My buddy said the last thing he saw was me folded in half with my feet up by my head, like folded in half, like with a shocked look like, oh, um, and uh, that was the last thing he remembers seeing before he went out. And, um, and then I start to recall everything and I start to be like, oh, I was on patrol in Iraq and I'm still like chill and I'm like, Oh yeah, and then I'm like, oh yeah, like, I was sitting in the back, I was sitting on a water cooler, and then all of a sudden, dude, like, the deepest sorrow I've ever experienced in my life, to this day, still haunts me, just, boom, just like exploded from the center of my being, as I really started to realize, like, oh my gosh, I'm dead, like, I'm a pile of guts on the floor in Iraq, I died. And I was really, really just like, I was vexed about a few things. Like I was vexed because I was like, this is so final. Like this is so finite. And like, I, I, I hadn't even lived. Like I was like, well, I was like 19. I was like, I hadn't even really lived. I haven't even like, I was just so like, oh my gosh, no, like I failed. I haven't lived on purpose yet. Like I didn't even really take advantage of this life thing. Like the miracle, the miracle that is life, like that we still, all the smart people in the world, still no one has no idea what consciousness is. They have no idea what life is. They have no idea what this planet really is. Like forget about outer space. We've, we have, haven't even discovered 80% of the ocean yet, right? So I just like in a second was just like feeling all these things and I was so upset that I hadn't really lived with any kind of like consciousness or purpose to all these things. The second thing was I was so upset because I felt like I failed 
because my pops, my dad didn't want me to become a Marine. Like you mentioned, you know, like when I told him I was going to be a Marine, he dangled me off the balcony of my, of, of, of a hotel under, after my high school graduation. And he's like, why aren't you afraid? I'm like, I'm not afraid because either you're going to drop me off the balcony or I'm going to become a Marine. And he finally let me up and was like, Hey, you know, I'll support you, but don't get killed. And I just remember being like, pray for me, you know? And, um, so in that moment I was so upset and I remember starting to see like everyone around me. Like I, I went and I saw my girlfriend and, and was just like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I failed you. I failed you. I died in Iraq. And like, I saw my mom and I was like, mom, mom, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, I saw my dad and, 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 and I was like apologizing and like, I saw like everyone important to me and I was kind of like leaving. And then I remember getting to my grandma and my grandma used to always tell me like, Byron, if you're, if, if ever anything, she's a little old Cherokee woman, like <laughs> sweet, but, but you know, she's still out there gardening and, you know, and, and, and working in the lawn, but she was always like, Byron, if anything's ever stronger than you, you just say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus by the third time and it'll go away. And I remember kind of being like, and I, and I heard that, like it was, we, I had this vision and then, um, I remember being able to look at my buddy, you know, Wellerman, who was one of my Marines sitting next to me, but I couldn't look at my body, but I wasn't in my body. He was looking at my body and he was like in like terror. And I remember looking at the side of his face and then I just remember praying. I just remember being like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And I remember being like, Father, if you, I may never be what you want me to be. Like I may never, ever be good enough. Like I may never be what you want me to be. But I, and I said it just like this. I was like, but I swear to you, if you send me back, I will go so, and I said, <laughs> I said, I will, I was like, I will go so ham at life. I was like, I will go so hard at life. I promise you, like, I won't let the grace that's being shown to me be in vain, you know? And, and I just was like, I'll go so hard at life. I may never be what you called me to be all of it. Like I may never get it all done, but I'm going to, I'm going to do my best. And I meant it with all my heart and I just kept praying to Jesus. And my buddies make fun of me to this day because they could all hear me as I came back into my body. And all of a sudden I was back in my body and I had body awareness. And I was like, and I was in the, in the undercarriage of the seven ton, like in the, like, you know, in, in the part of the crater that was left in the seven ton, I got hit directly. So a drum of 60 pounds of explosives, I was sitting on a water cooler like this, exploded directly underneath me. I was in a seven ton and I got, I suffered a fractured elbow and a, a uh, 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 class four or whatever concussion because I was out. Marine Corps lost my paperwork. I never got my purple heart. God bless them. We'll deal with that later, I guess. You know, whatever. <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, man. I um, but it's all documented. And I, uh, I then all of a sudden was in my body, and I felt my body just go like like a jet turning back on, like like power back up. And I remember, but I couldn't move, and I was like, Father, I can't do this if I can't move. And, um, all of a sudden I just kept praying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then all of a sudden, um, I got my power back in my body and I was like, and I just remember this like righteous anger came over me and I heard my dad, my dad got shot, uh, with a shotgun, um, at point blank range. And I remember when he was, when I was younger and I asked him like, how'd you not die, dad? And, you know, I thought if people get shot, they die. You know, when you're little, you think someone gets shot in the foot, they're dead. But like, you know, he was like, son, <laughs> my dad's a hard man. Son, people die when they give up. He's like, people die when they give up. I just fought like hell. That's what he said. He's like, I fought like hell. I still had reasons to live. I had your sisters. I had you. And I just remember being like, I'm not going to die here. And I just, I felt like I had superpowers. I got up out of that crater in the ground. And I remember like, getting myself together and I got my weapon and I looked in front of me and the, the, the ladder was jarred shut from the blast. I remember kicking the, kicking the, the ladder until it like unjarred. And then I looked over the edge, like a seven foot drop to the bottom. I'm in full kit and I black out. And then, uh, I wake up in a field like 40 yards away on a knee setting security for myself. I like kind of realize like what I'm doing. And my buddies said, basically, they're like, dude, you like had crackhead strength. You woke up freaked out, kicked your way out of the vehicle, jumped like 15 feet out of the back of the thing and sprinted off into the field. Um, and, and then that's where I kind of woke up and was like, you know, my guys were still on in the, in the truck and I pulled them out of the truck. And, uh, I'll tell you this 
end part. I don't know if I told you guys this on the last one, but um, I pull him out of the truck and I'm like, hey, get out, of, get out of the truck, get over here. So we find the nearest building to where we got blown up. The whole entire village, or not village, but like this little city area is ghost town because we already told everyone we're coming. We've been fighting in the area. We're like, leave if you're not a combatant, all that stuff. And um, sure enough, dude, there's six dudes just hanging out in like a mechanic shop nearby, you know, just kicking it. And then you know how it is, man. Like when they're doing like normal dude stuff, they're wearing their like, you know, man dresses and stuff. God bless them. Sorry, I don't remember what, what to call it at the moment. But, like, they're wearing the, 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 the dress, the, their whole thing, you know. But when they're doing Muji stuff, right, when they're doing Mujahideeni stuff, they're rocking, like, tennis shoes and, like, and like sweatsuits, you know what I'm saying? Got jeans and stuff on. And you're like, so, of course, I got six mans. I got six military-age males chilling uh, in the shop. They're the only dudes in the whole area. Uh, we just got blown up, so we pull them out. We get them on their knees and we're like, uh, no, we pull them out. They're all standing in like a, in a half circle and my squad, we're all guns up and uh, we're like, who here speaks English? And like the alpha dude looks me dead in my eyes and he's like, I don't speak English. But he says it in perfect English. Like, like he was like from like totally from New York, like from the States. He's like, I don't speak English. And he like grins at me. And I just remember like, and so we put these dudes on their knees and I look at my guys, and my guys are banged up. We still haven't really gotten any medical help. Like, I could have someone have an internal hemorrhaging at this moment. Like, I'm, you know, and when you get blown up, you're extremely emotional. Like, you almost can't stop, like, the flood of, 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 of like, tears, you know? Like, um, and I remember just being like, and one of my homies just leans over. He's like, these are the dudes. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, in the Marine Corps, you know, like, these are the dudes, you know? And we're like... We know we got drop weapons. We know we got, you know, fresh AKs just hanging out, you know, because, you know, we just cleared some houses and we just happened to have some AKs in the truck, you know. And so that was a choice point where I was like, yo, I could smoke these dudes because I know they did it. I got AKs. We could just throw some AKs on these bodies. And like Byron, the, the, the human, like the earthly version of Byron, like the man, like the normal dude was like, Say less. Like, like, we smoke these fools, put the AKs on them, draw smiley faces, and don't mess with the Marines. Like, like literally, like, like, this is how we get down. And then we go drink some Moosh Cola, you know, and we get our one free call home because we got blown up today and they didn't kill us. Like, that That was the, the you know, the fleshly Byron was like, you know. Um, but I remember, like... I felt like the spirit came to me and showed me the, 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 the future. Like he showed me the path of my younger Marines, like drinking and like committing suicide. Cause we executed six dudes who were on their knees and like all the, like the future implications. And I just remember in my spirit, just being like, mm, it's too gray. Like, no. And, and it was actually hard for me to make that decision, but I was able to make that decision and say, no, not today. I was blessed once again, you know, I, three months before I got out, you know, I remember just being scared, like, you know, like father, like, what am I going to do? You know, I'm sitting in my kitchen and I'm praying and I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm, and, and it's not like, you know, like I said, it's not like I hit my knees and I'm like the thou out father, you know, thine father in heaven. You know, it's not like that. It's like, you know, Hey, you know, like you got me this far. Like, what do I do? I'm scared, you know? And, uh, you know, I don't always hear anything, but this was like another time in my life where I really heard and I got guidance and he was like, yo, he was, he didn't say yo, I say yo, but anyways, he was just like, <laughs> go to this bar, go to Hennessy's Tavern, like go to this bar. I saw Hennessy's Tavern. He's like, you're going to become a bodyguard. You're going to travel the world. And those of you who know my brands and know everything that I've been able to achieve by the grace of God, you know. It's just beautiful, you know, like some people say, I ain't choose the game, the game chose me. But like, that's real for me, you know? And so I'm like, boom, like I'm like, bet. Like I just remember hope and peace that passes all understanding, you know? And I've been able to walk in life with peace that passes all understanding through all the trials and crazy things I've experienced, you know? Whether it was, you know, just drugs, business struggles, relational struggles, um, you know, all the different things, violence, you know? And I remember 
walking and walking like kind of kind of being like boom i'm good like i just got the download like i know what's going down so then i um i walk in the kitchen and my my girl at the time walks in and she's just like yo uh, i look at her and i'm like hey i know i know what i'm gonna do you know and i'm all excited and stuff and she's just like uh what and i'm like i'm gonna go bounce at hennessy's and then i'm gonna become a bodyguard and i'm gonna travel the world and she's like just like laughing but also pissed and she's like yo you're not going to bounce at Hennessy's like absolutely not like ceasefire little dude like stop and I just remember being like like why is she what and then of course like you know me being a bouncer like she knows me like that's the end of our relationship <laughs> you know so she's like this is not good for me you're not doing this and I just remember, and I actually said something that was very Jesus-y to her without realizing it now. And I think back, it's, it is kind of cool. And I just was like, when it happened, she was like, God wouldn't tell you that. God doesn't, doesn't say things like that. Like, and I was like, I know a few things. I was like, I don't know everything, but I know a few things. I know that God's used a donkey to talk to a man of God. I know that he's used a harlot, a hooker to, to, to do things in the Bible. I know he's used so many imperfect, he uses imperfect people, imperfect plans, imperfect vessels to do what he's here to do because we're all just so imperfect. We're all so messed up. I was like, so I'm not going to sit here and judge whether this, this plan is holy enough. You know, like I told you guys, like I'm kind of against religion. I'm all about relationship. I'm not going to sit here and judge what I heard as whether it's holy or not. Uh, enough, you know, for us to judge with our little earthly ideas about it. I just know what I've heard, and I do know that over the course of my life, this voice has been guiding me. And uh, and then I said the Jesusy part, and I was like, all I ask is that when it happens exactly how I've told you it's going to happen, is that you believe. Um, and she was like a new Christian, or like starting to try to be or whatever. And I was just like, all I ask is that when it happens exactly the way I've told you it's going to happen, is that you believe. So I went to Hennessy's Tavern and I'm in Hennessy's and I'm kicking it, not kicking it, I'm working, you know, and I remember just trying to be a good dude and I'm like, it's the end of the night and I'm like busting some tables, like I'm cleaning up some tables or whatever. Like I didn't have to, but it's just the kind of employee I, I, I am and was and all that. And um, these two dudes are just like, yo, have him do it. Now I talked to these guys later on, one of them still one of my really good friends, Luke Agajanian, and, and uh, you'll see him in my content and all that. Um, and uh, they're like, dude, we were watching you all night. We watched you, checked our IDs on the way in, the way you were interacting with people, you know, your social dynamics, da 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 the way you carry yourself, the way you look, da 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 They're like, we've been studying you all night. It's like that moment in training day. He's like, you've been planning this all week? I've been planning this all month. You know what I'm saying? This is chess, not checkers, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so then, you know, they're like, have him do it. And I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, what do you need, you know? And, um... Sure enough, they're like, you, uh, are you getting out of the Marine Corps? I'm like, yeah. They're like, uh, you got combat action? I'm like, yes, sir. They're like, um, then Luke's like, go get these two permits. Give me a call back in two weeks. I'll show you how to make a lot more money doing what you're doing. And I'm like, okay. Bet. Boom. So I got my new mission. Boom. Went got those permits. Came back. I'm in my first job interview on Rodeo Drive outside of a jewelry store called Leon's. You can't even get in. There's no handle on the door back then. You know what I'm saying? You can't even get into this this place unless you have an appointment or you're like a celebrity or a who's who's -y. You know what I'm saying? Like like normal people can't walk in. So I, I pull up for my interview and I'm trying to open the door and I can't open the door. And like the, the team's inside like looking at me, like kind of laughing at me. Like I'll look at the new dude, you know, and then I see my first client. And, um, you know, they let me in and I start my interview. Um... And, uh, you know, it was a, a big time uh, religious leader, uh, missionary, evangelistic type of situation. And um, we hit over 60 some odd countries that first year. Essentially what it was like, it would be like getting drafted from flag football and being put directly into the NFL. We were the biggest, the most highly traveled executive protection team uh, for sure in the state of California, but also probably in the United States. Like most dudes in this game, they get in, they get on with a celebrity and it's like, oh, it's tour season. Like we're going on the Europe tour and it's like, oh, they go on tour for like a few months, you know? Um, and it's like, yo, we go hard for a few months and then the rest of the year, they're like looking for work or doing whatever their other day job, you know what I mean? For me, growing up in this game, like it was like dog years. So it was like straight up 
every single week we're trying to just p spread the gospel. Like, like my client was on mission. So it was like, yo, every minute we can get, every dollar we can get goes into traveling and spreading the gospel. So like there was no tour season. We just lived on the road. Like, so it was just like, hey, 11 days, seven, seven, seven cities, 14 days, 11 countries. Like, like it was nuts, you know? And like we would come back and I would walk into my, you know, I would walk into my, my, my tailor, uh, uh, the, 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 the place that washes my suits. And I'd be like, yo, I need these suits in the next three hours. Like, who do I got to pay or kill or whatever? And she like, you know, she knew me and she'd like turn my suits around. But like, I lived at like one of the, I, I went from nothing to the highest, some of the highest levels in executive protection like this. Um, and, and that's how it all started. I was with that client for seven years. No one can stay with that client because it was a very interesting environment. It was a very hyper spiritual environment. In order to do that job, you had to have more than just physical capabilities. Like you had to be able to like understand like when, you know, the client was a man, but then also he would get into the spirit. Like he would be operating on a different level, you know, and, and it's a really interesting conversation because what I'm really talking to you guys about is how I have achieved success on earth by being able to access the Holy Spirit in my life access through my relationship with God and that that's been the magic you know and so I learned how to flow with him and how to work with him and how to be out of the way when I needed to be out of the way how to be in the way when I needed to be in the way how to be how to how to you know be more than just a protection physically right um, and so my first six months there I probably my first I'm sorry my first prime month there I saw like I mean few months there I saw you know like close to two dozen guys come through at least trying to get this job guys that were bigger than me stronger than me smarter than me Navy SEAL Secret Service guys that are like when we went to pick them up like hey Byron we're gonna get the you are gonna get like your number two because we needed two, we needed one more guy to work with me and Cali because I was working every single day I got 23 half days off my first year now coming out of the Marine Corps that's like wow like you know like this ain't hard like i make real money you know like i'm making six figures i'm 21 you know like like i no one's trying to kill me i get to eat every night and take showers and stuff like you know what i mean like iraq you know like iraq 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 right was iraq so like you come from that into all of a sudden you know quadrupling your income and like living in private jets and and seven diamond hotels forget about seven five star hotels like seven diamond hotels and like you know, you're in palaces, king's palaces, and you're doing all this stuff. So, like, for me, I was just on, on, on cloud nine with kicks, you know. So, I grew up in this game at a supercharged rate, was elevated in a supercharged way. Um, and that was kind of the birth of all a lot of my brands. And it was really, you know, like, as, as much as I try to be, like, a protector and, and a workman that needeth not be ashamed, like, training myself and investing myself like it wasn't my strength or my wisdom or my might or my coolness you know um uh that got me to where i'm at it literally was hearing the, the voice of god that got me to where I, I to the highest level in the executive protection industry at 21 years old which is unheard of to be able to do at that age you know and i just had to always give him the credit for it now it didn't come without its struggles because as a christian and being in some of these environments i got to see the business of church Right. I got to see the business of religiosity. Right. And I had to and I actually working in this environment was the most testing thing for my Christianity, because like, you know, in Iraq, it was like father, like, you know, like we got left at the top of a hill one time for about a week and I was sure I was going to die. I was sure these they we, we there was a recon unit on the other side of an MSR that was supposed to back us up and we felt kind of safe with them there. They had just blown up one of our seven tons that was left over the wreckage over like yonder. But anyways, long story short, the recon unit gets attacked and blown up. Their gunny loses their legs and then they pull out and it was just me and my boys up there for nights. I had to turn off my radio. And I was like, sure, I was gonna die. We couldn't stand up during the day. We had to hide in the craters from them dropping mortars on that hill like during the day and hope that the enemy wouldn't come up the freaking hill. And, and, and try to kill all of us little 18 and 19 year olds, right? Um, but that stuff brings you closer to God. This was the opposite, you know? This was, this, was, this was you're in the lap of luxury with thousands of people that say that they are Christians and you're watching the way money's being exchanged and you're watching the way that um, Christians are acting and you're just like, it's such a turnoff, you know? 
And I remember being disgusted. And I remember being like, yo, Father, like, if this is what Christianity is, I want no part in it. I don't respect these people. They're soft. They're weak. They're greedy. They're, they're pathetic. Um, and uh, I don't respect it. And I don't respect them. And they have no power, you know. And then uh, he came back to me and was just like, you're really going to judge me based on people? Like, you really think that it's, like, like and, and, and expounding on that, like, you really think it's fair to judge the God of the universe based on people's performance? Like, don't you realize the whole entire equation we're in is that he had to come and die for you because all of us are so broken and so imperfect and so messed up and so, like, I, you know, I, I do bad things before the sun goes down today. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, that was like a gut check. And it was like, what do you have? Like, do you have a relationship or are you putting your faith in a religion? Because if you're putting your faith in a religion, I totally get it. But if you're here about relationship, this is me and you. And it's always been just me and you, you know? And so that really got me to like ratchet down to like, what do I really, you know, what am I really about? You know, and he guided me through that situation. And I saw crazy things because it was a hyper spiritual environment. You know, I saw, I saw demon possessed people. You know, I had dudes on my detail that didn't really believe in that until they saw it with their own two eyes. Dudes coming over the radio, one of my best friends coming over the radio. Yo, bro, uh, if there's a such thing as demon possession, yo, this is it. <laughs> I'm like, you good, man? You need backup back there? He's like, nah, these women are praying over it, but like, this is for sure it. <laughs> and you can hear like the seething and just cussing and people getting thrown across the room, you know? And like, you know, I saw a dude one time, I got the, I got the heck scared out. I saw darkness because we go all around the world. So I'd like, we're in Africa. And like, one thing I learned is like places where people have nothing, spirituality is extra, 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 extra powerful. So like voodoo is like really ultra powerful in like Haiti and, and, and these other countries where they have nothing. But at the same time, we're sitting there listening to the Zulus, praise God. And like the power goes out in the building and like, yo, these people were praising God with every single thing in their body because all they, ha they, they walked miles to get there. All they got was Jesus. And when they sung, homie, like I thought I was going to be raptured. Like I get chills just thinking about it. The power goes out in the building. You can't even hear the instruments. And they're just singing. And it was just like shattering. Like it was just the most powerful thing, you know. And like, you know, and we would see miracles, you know. And like, you know, but at the same time, I saw zombies like i saw people that they did voodoo ceremonies on that they turned into actual zombies that like just 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 completely brain dead and all they would do is take orders and they were like indentured slaves and servants i saw a dude i saw a four-legged midget one time you know like a, like like and it was just you could just feel the bentness you know like i saw demon possession i saw healings i saw all these different things you know i i I saw a lot of things. You it was saw like another a four-legged midget. I saw a four-legged midget, dog. Yo, <laughs> so like I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here, and you know, uh, you know, we're 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 in the middle of a service, and we're in Africa. So you're seeing all these like, there's like just more witchcraft. So when you go to these environments, it's like a clash. So it's like the light and the darkness clash. I was sitting at tables with um, witches that were like, yeah, we tried to come and cast spells on, on your, your client, but like we couldn't get our spells to penetrate like the, the force field of light that was around him. And it saved me, it caused me to be saved because I realized, you know, this chick that was talking was like a bride of Satan. Like apparently there's only like 13 brides of Satan or whatever. And she was like, I was there with my other sister bride and I couldn't cast a spell, whatever. Anyway, so like, the bottom line is I'm sitting, the midget thing, I'm sitting here, I'm walking up the aisle and like once things would become, start to get spiritual and like people would be praying in tongues and like, you know, I watch witches try to cast spells and things like that and like run up to him and like throw like witchy stuff on him and things like that. We'd be protecting him. Um, I saw a demon possessed lady slither down the aisle on her face with no hands like this one time towards the client and I had to like deal with that. Um, but if you know who you are in the spirit, you're going to tread on serpents and scorpions. You you are protected, right? And you have authority, right? So that's a whole other level of protection. You know, it's kind of what I'm like talking to you about, but not talking to you about, right? So yeah, man, dude goes walking past me and it's a little black guy about this big. He has a muscle shirt on, a beanie, and he has legs coming out of his knees and like, like, like other feet that are working 
like coming out of his knees and he's walking by me, bro. And I just remember just being like, like just, you know, you're in shock. Like he's you're blinking, like, is this real? You know what I'm saying? Wow. Um, yeah, man. I, I, I remember walking through a crowd one time and when things would get spiritual, I would like pray and I would be like, and, I, and even to this day when I lift weights, I'm like, Father, I thank you that you've given me the strength, right? And he's always sustained me and given me more of what I've chosen to work. And, and, um, and I remember when we would, things would get spiritual, I would just kind of like be like, Father, and I would feel like a cloak of protection would come over me and I would just start moving through the crowd and just looking for the anomalies and um, looking um, and, and bit profiling and all that stuff, but also looking in the spirit to see like, you know, who really is dangerous. And I remember one time I got shook, like I got scared, man, because I was walking through a crowd and then all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, it felt like. I saw this claw in front of my face and it was like a finger that was this thick and it had like this gigantic monstery looking splintery fingernail on top of it. And the claw was like, it was like a finger that was this thick and it was all warty and like crabby and, and like hard, but like overgrown and it had this huge claw on it. And all of a sudden I was walking through the crowd and it was like in my face and I just, I like lost my breath and just stopped. And I'm staring at this thing and I look over and there's this dude that's, and I don't know if that was just a disease, but like science can explain a lot of things in the mental health realm and in, 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 in the physical realm. Like, oh, you know, like you're having midnight terrors because the electrical signals in your body are shorting out. So you feel like someone's choking you. And when I got my master's in psychology, they're like, oh yeah, you're hearing voices because what's happening is the electrical signals in your body. But like, there's another realm, you know, like, they still don't know what consciousness is. They still can't really quantify like what what's driving this biological equipment that I'm using to communicate with you, you know? Um, and, you know, so there's a spirit realm that can be measured in some ways by science. Oh, you have 60 watts of energy in your body. Like, yeah, but there's more, right? Quantum physics is digging into starting to actually understand a lot of this, but I got to see a lot in that spirit realm working with him for those seven years. And it ended up putting me in a position where, you know, it brought me closer to my God. Um, and, and now when I move through reality, like that's a whole nother level of awareness. You know, if wow. I can keep my heart in the right posture and I can keep that relationship open, he guides me. Like I would have never, and actually on the transition, like I would have never had the guts to do half the things that I've done in business if I hadn't had that. But not to skip the transition, all of that success and all of that emotional stress and like trauma and, ex and, all, and, and, and making all that money and, you know, going that hard, what it ended up starting to do to me is it caused me to start like turning to drugs because like I would be in these hyper, hyper spiritual environments and I would be getting all this dopamine and like all these crazy things would be happening. We're traveling the world and, um, you know, you're on a high like all the time. And then when you come back, you're just kind of like, you're just kind of like, well, I want to stay on that high. And then you have Iraq that like, I was like a dopamine addict, basically. Like my brain was like, yo, like someone's trying to kill you. You, you're, you have that dopamine kind of way of life. And then you come back to normal life and it's like you're a Lamborghini forced to drive in a school zone for the rest of your life. Like it's Nerf for the rest of your life. You know, like you're a carnivore that's now a vegetarian for the rest of your life. Like nothing against vegetarians, but you guys kind of get what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? And so I was addicted to my own dopamine. And so I started turning to like, you know, molly and cocaine and partying and since i was really strong mentally i could and smoking weed and all this stuff i could be highly functional so like i could do all those drugs wake up at 9 a.m go to the gym go to work <laughs> and just be good you know and so i started playing that game really really heavy and you know it was just crazy because even in all that looking for something I felt like I was missing from, from not being at war. There's a weird sense of like war sucked. It was the suckiest place ever. You know, it was, it was like, you know, your girl's cheating on you and you might die tomorrow. Like 
was horrible. He hit the reset button on someone's life. But then there was another part of it where as a man, in some ways, as a warrior, I felt like I was kind of alive in a way that I never would never really get to know again until I discovered, you know, purpose, right? Um, and mission, my new mission. And so I was longing for that and being and behaving all the time in these corporate environments. And um, it was like there's a beast inside of me that was trying to, that was eating me alive. And I think it's true for a lot of veterans. You know, you're back here, you're trying to behave, you're trying to be polite and socially whatever. And you're listening to all these silly villains with their emotions and how they feel and stuff. And you just want to like wreck, you want to let the beast out, right? And what I think is that that beast eats dudes alive if they don't learn how to deal with it. And it's like having a high drive dog. You have to find your new fight. You have to find your new mission. And so I got to a certain point where I was like, dude, you're doing all these drugs six to seven days a week. Uh, you're good, but something's going to happen. You know, like something's going to happen. Like, dude, like one slip up, I had run-ins with the cops where it was like, they were just rolling by me. And like, if they would have, you know, done one, like search the car or chose me that day or like, you know, whatever, like it would have been it, you know, like there's one time where I was like, you know, pulled over with like, you know, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but I was doing bad stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I just remember being like, dude, like my life could change in an instant and I'm so blessed. And so fortunately I've always been the type of person that can kind of sense the heat, you know, before it's coming around the corner and, you know, the Holy Spirit was like, yo, you need to, you need, you're going to throw it all away. You're creating so many opportunities for the enemy to, to take away the purpose I've given you. And that's what this game is about. You have a God given purpose. You have a destiny. You have something that's inside of you that needs to come out that the world stinking needs. Like I'm not that cool. Like I'm not that smart. I'm not that amazing, but I've been able to create brands that have helped hundreds of people get into the private security industry and change their lives that have helped thousands of people um, on the motivation inspiration side of things that have helped thousands and th I mean we're talking like uh, five million impressions a month online of you know being able to like educate and inspire people I never thought I could do any of that I wouldn't even have had the ideas or the courage to take action on these things if if, if I didn't have something behind me being like all I need is for you to go and I'll show you, you know? And so I, you know, I pulled out of Cali. I went down to Florida. I started my first private security company and I quit everything. Fortunately, by the grace of God, I was able to just walk away from that way of life. Um, <clears throat> and I dabbled here and there a little bit, you know, but then I was able to really get that out of my life and really get on mission and start building my future and waking up and getting off, listening to music and start listening to audio books and, and really, really upgrading everything. And then I wrote the book, Finding Meaning After the Military, which is all about the tools I use to transition. You know, it's a book all about transition, finding meaning after the military. I'm passionate about executive protection because it's like, I'm a protector. I was created to be a protector, you know. Uh, and it's such an honor. You know, like, you can't just walk in and be an executive protection agent like, you need to train. You need to be legit. There's a, lot of pre there's a lot of pretenders in this game. You know, like since the beginning of time, there's always been an elite class of protectors, the Praetorian Guard, the, you know, elite class within every warrior class that's taken away from the normal fighters and is, and is given special skills and a higher tier of responsibility to protect the nobility of, of, of that time. When I look at protection, I see no greater love than this and a man that would lay down his life for another. Right. And so for me, this has been a way for me to serve as a, 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 a combatant in all the right ways to restore order to people's lives when chaos is there. Right. You have to train to be strong enough to stand between the darkness and innocence. And so, you know, it's a high level of service and it's a high level of service that's in alignment with my values. But if I was going to be completely honest with you, I would say that the executive protection aspect of my life has been another battle in the war for my destiny. So it's been another training ground. It was like when I was a Marine, it's been another place where I've really been um, groomed to be able to do a few things. 
And I believe that my purpose is to make the world a safer place by helping good people to become more willing, capable, and prepared to help good people to become more dangerous, right? Um, the meek shall inherit the earth. You all heard Jordan Peterson's talk about that. It's not about being gentle and meek. The actual translation means those who uh, know how to use a sword but don't have to because they, they, they're competent at violence, right? Not that we want to use violence. The Protector Nation, one of our emblems, has a, a warrior with a face mask and there's a tear because like, we don't want to do violence, but we know as long as there's evil men and evil people, we must do violence. We must protect the light. We must protect what's good. And so my education in executive protection, running teams, putting teams on VIPs, huge functions, you know, ranging from, you know, 800 people in a room up to 250,000 people um, every night of a weekend, seeing close to a million people in a weekend internationally, organizing six to 10,000 law enforcement aid officers and different things like this. Like 15 years of that has really put me in a position to be able to take the skills that I learned at the highest levels and bring them to the everyday individual. I believe that we're gonna make the world a safer place by helping good people to become more dangerous. Protectors are the white blood cells in the body of humanity. And so everything that I've been groomed through the Marine Corps, through actually going to war and fighting other grown men, through uh, doing violence, through learning how to hard target and avoid and assess and all the soft skills that go around actually leave, living a safer pattern of life as we train our clients to do so. Um, now it's equated into really being able to multiply protectors in the world. And so much of being a protector is the soft skills. It's not your Judy chop, your karate chop. I can teach a mom how to do it. I can teach, I can, I can add to what guys at some of the top levels do. And that's what I do with these different brands, the Protector Nation, the, the League of Executive Protection Specialists, um, you know, and my, my executive protection company, Bravo Research Group. So now what I'm really becoming more and more passionate about is, you know, we put teams on churches, we put teams on schools, you know, and, and we put teams on VIPs who, you know, our values align with them, you know, and we're able to defend and protect and we're choosy about who we take. Like I won't just take some celebrity because they're cool and they have the clout or whatever. Like I, I honestly, like I was telling you earlier, I fired a client just, just yesterday, literally just yesterday um, for a number of different reasons. So now we're in a position where, you know, not all money is good money, but I can help the single mom who is, realizes how vulnerable she is in this world that's becoming darker and darker as the hour gets later and later. I can give her the online education she needs to live a safer pattern of life. And I have a whole suite of assets that I can, in the, from the comfort of her own home learn, I can take her to a physical training environment where we can teach her the hard skills, the soft skills and the hard skills. I can take guys from the military and I can plug them into one of the fastest growing industries in the world, the executive protection industry, and get him making six figures in three to six months and get him protecting people. And, and the right people. And I can put competent protectors out there. So now I'm like this conduit for creating competent protectors in the good people and networks and cultures. That's what, that's what these brands are, is they're tribes and networks and cultures that, like I said earlier, those women and kids that are getting raped right now around the world, there ain't no angels zip lining in the windows protecting them. You know, I hope you guys went and saw Sound of Freedom. There wasn't, you know, if, if, if my man wasn't coming, who would be coming? And so now I'm equipping a high volume of good people to be able to do the things that need to be done in order for innocence and the light of the world to be harder to get snuffed out as the hour becomes more dark. And that's now my God-given um, purpose in, in the battle for my destiny in order to make sure that the one thing I prayed when I got blown up, which was Father... If you give me another chance, I'm going to go ham. I'm going to go hard in the paint. And, and, and because of that, I have the tattoo across my back. Um, Gratia Adam De Summit Kudsum, Corinthians 15.10, which is by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul, he goes hard, right? By the grace of God, I am what I am. But uh, that grace was not given to me in vain because I went harder than them all. And that's his heart. That's his engine. That's his ego talking. But then he reins himself back and he says, yet not by my strength, but by the strength of Christ that dwells inside me. And so 
everyone that is a Christian, they're here to build the kingdom, to help the kingdom of light invade this dark, broken world. And that has to happen. When God wants to get something done, he sends a man, he sends a woman, he sends a human being. You know, he sent his, his son, he sends an apostle, a prophet, he sends people. He has a, you, you talk about the church, it's the body of Christ, right? So it's his body. Satan also has a body. You see him do Satan worship during the Super Bowl and things like that. Um, and so there's this battle going on between faith and fear, between light and dark, between the victimizers and those who protect them. And so my way of serving the kingdom of light is to help those people that are part of that kingdom truly become meek. Those people who know how to use a sword, but yet don't have to. Mm. As I close this thing out, I think my real purpose with, you know, calling you back up and like you giving me a chance to come on here again, you know, was, was really just to make sure that, you know, I tell my story and my experience in the right context because I go on a lot of podcasts and I give a lot of talks, you know, um, and it's not always the most appropriate venue uh, to talk about these things. But I wanted to get this body of, of information out there so people could really understand, like, like I'm not that amazing, you know? Like, I, when you look at my life, I just want to see what one imperfect man, uh, can, I want you to see what Im one imperfect man can do um, by the grace of God if he gives his imperfections, you know, to God on the altar of progress, like, on the altar of just trying to be better, just trying to do the best I can, just trying to pick up my three stones and go fight the giant, like, just giving my imperfect, my vessel, you know, like, like, what do you want me to do? Like father, you know, and that's been the thing that got me into the executive protection industry at the highest level at age 21. That's been the thing that's helped me start a podcast in an industry where if you speak about what we do, you get blackballed and kicked out of the industry, which then became the number one podcast in the space. That's that faith and that support and that guidance from, you know, my relationship with my creator is what's uh, caused me to start the protector nation, you know, and start um, um, activating protectors all over the, the world, you know, and, and has blessed me with a thriving, uh, with thriving brands that have blessed my family and, and, and uh, has made us, you know, I want people to see the glory. Like I want people to see like what it's really like to serve him. Like if you say no to everything that the world's offering you in terms of these low values of, you know, like, like I get it. Like, you know, like the world offers you all these things that seem to be amazing like promiscuity and drugs and all this stuff. And you think to yourself like, oh, my life's gonna be so boring without this. Like, I don't, like this is fun, you know? But then when you start to realize it, when you focus on the right things and you clear yourself out and you start to get on mission and you start to get purpose and you start to get guidance and you start to get provision and protection from above, like you get on, you tap into a whole nother system, a whole nother way of life. And so I feel sometimes like I'll operate in the context of whoever show it is. But like you giving me an opportunity to really give people what I really carry and what has been the secret weapon that a dyslexic, like chubby mama's boy from the Bahamas uh, has used to be able to cr become the number one icon in his industry and work with all the greatest people in the tactical industry. And, you know, I was just in a movie and I'm in the Call of Duty. Uh, I'm in Call of Duty, two different versions of the Call of Duty video game. Like how you create something that's beyond your wildest dreams uh, uh, for a life. And I, and I have kids and I have a beautiful home bigger than I ever thought I would have and multiple, like how I have been able to do those things. And it's all been by the grace of God. And it's all been in, 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 in relationship with him, not religion, but you know, understanding that Jesus Christ is my gateway to unlocking a whole nother kingdom the kingdom of heaven, having that invade my life. And then me being an example of, of that on this planet and being able to look life in the eyes with peace that passes all understanding that only he can give me. And, um, until the day, you know, I die for something amazing, being able to, to be a light in dark places, you know? And so that's just, I wanted to give you guys what I really got. You know, I wanted to give people that might be looking for answers, you know, an idea that like, you just gotta ask God, like ask Jesus, like, hey, you know, like make yourself real to me, you know, like I don't know you,
but I want you to be with me, you know, like show yourself to me as the son of God. Like I'm going to, I'm going to look into this, you know, and, uh, and, and, and Byron says that he's been living his life and he's been protected and he's been guided by the Holy Spirit, um, through your son. Like, what's that about? Like, talk to me, make yourself real to me. And he will. And, um, it's just such an honor to be elevated at, to the place I've been elevated to so I can pay back that debt that I, I, I know I have for having this second chance, which is not letting the grace that has been given to me be in vain. Um, by the grace of God, I am what I am, which is tattooed across my back. I've been protected. I'm glad you came back. Always happy to have you back. <laughs> and we could always run it back, man, over and over, brother. <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, appreciate you, Byron. Hey. Thank, thanks for taking a seat, brother. It's an honor. Thank you. Boom. Woo! Yeah. I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared. Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair. Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear. Take me your way cause I don't like here. Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air. 